Uh, hello, people on the internet. Thanks for tuning into this talk about consuming observability features in Node.js. And uh, hopefully what I'm presenting here will be useful in your day to day. But before we get into the talk, let's do a brief intro of, uh, of who I am here. So like Ryan said, my name is Luke Holmquist or Lucas, it's either, either or. Um, so I work at Red Hat, I'm a senior software engineer there. And uh, my main focus is on the NodeShift project. Uh, this project aims to help developers who are creating Node applications and want to deploy them on OpenShift and Kubernetes kind of in an easy way. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, uh, at Sienna Luke. Uh, it's a combination of the school I went to and my name. I, I saw there was some tweet going around how, how you got your, uh, your Twitter name. So that was the, uh, that was the answer to that question. Um, also, just a couple of random facts about myself. I'm a huge fish fan. Of the, um, so if you were into the, the band fish, not like fishing, you know, you know all that stuff. Uh, so if you're also a fan and you want to talk music, you can find me on Twitter with that too. Um, and also I'm the current title holder for the Star Wars trivia uh, contest at my local library and know entirely too many facts about the original trilogy. So again, if you were a Star Wars nerd like myself, um, I usually always have my Yoda figure here with me doing the talks. He usually travels, but now that we're remote, he's still next to me. Um, so if you're also a Star Wars nerd like myself, you know, find me on Twitter and we can talk Star Wars and, and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And as a special bonus, if you do stick around to the end, um, I will divulge what that winning question was and answer it for you that um, that won the Star Wars trivia contest. So a little extra benefit for sticking around for the whole thing. Um, and since I'm a, I'm, I am remote uh, at, the, at the moment, um, I share, I'll share where I'm located. I'm, I live in upstate New York. So if you're not from New York, then don't worry about this picture. But if you're from, you are from New York, then you'll kind of know what I'm talking about with, the, with, this, with this photo. All right, so let's get into the talk itself. So congratulations, you've deployed your application to production, most likely in a container, on some sort of container platform like Kubernetes or OpenShift. At the moment, your application is working well, your users are happy, and everything seems to be going pretty well. So now what, you know? Uh, how do you keep your application running and running well? How do you keep those users happy? Because that's always a, 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 key, a key thing. So a key part of the now what question is being able to observe what's going on within our application. For example, how many resources is the application using? Is the application calling a function that is blocking the node uh, event loop, causing users to wait longer than they expect? Or is, there, or is there a REST endpoint that is having intermittent failures and your users are becoming unhappy because of that? So begin, being able to determine when things are outside of the norm will help keep your application running and your users happy. So with that said, let's take a quick look at what we'll be going over today in this talk. First, we're gonna take a look at some of the key observability metrics that Node provides natively, as well as some new additions that have recently landed. Next, we'll take a look at how we can get access to this data when our application is running a production in a Kubernetes type environment. And after that, we'll take a look at some of the things you should be collecting. And finally, we'll end with a quick demo um, with some of the things that we talked about in this from this list. So before we get into it, we should probably define what observabil observability is exactly. So according to Wikipedia, it's a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its external outputs. Well, what does that mean exactly? So in the context of this talk, Internal states would be the functions and other business logic that is being executed and processed in our application. And the external outputs are the things that we want to look at or observe to see if everything runs is running as expected. So we can pre probably rewrite this as a measure of how well our application is running using some metrics that our runtime provides. And with that definition under our belts, let's see some of the different runtime metrics that Node has to offer natively. And since we know that Node is built on top of V8, uh, well, not the drink, um, so there we go. That's the right logo. Uh, we can access some of that data as well. Okay, let's see what's first. So first up is everyone's favorite tool to debug with. I know it is mine, console log. Uh, it's maybe not the greatest for production, but you know, whatever. 
I was tempted not, you know, I was tempted not to put this in, but I'm sure that if I didn't, that somebody on in the internet would probably be like, well, you know, actually you, you should have used console log. So this is for all those dudes who are going to PM me after this. Um, I probably don't want to explain how this works. I'm sure we've all had similar statements like this, you know, whether it's here or why or huh, or it worked. So next up, we have some different ways of doing profiling. Um, for those that are, are new to what profiling is, when talking about coding, a profiler is an analysis, analysis software that measures frequency and duration of function calls, as well as making sure that those functions are producing the desired result. While there are third-party tools that can be used, Node actually has the capability built in. As I just mentioned, it is built on top of the V8 engine. The V8 profiler allows you to sample the stack at regular intervals during the execution of your application, which gets logged as a series of ticks. This can be done in the command line while your application while you're running your application using the prof flag. This produces a log file that needs to be processed in order to become useful to look at. It can be processed with the dash s prof underscore process flag. This right here is just a sample of a section of what the output or the log output could be. And for this particular example, we can see that there's a node crypto function that seems to be taking up a lot of time. With that knowledge, you could go back into your application code and pinpoint what, what it is that's happening and make the necessary adjustments. In this particular example, which is taken from the guide on profiling, which is on nodejs.org, the code is using a synchronous version of that particular crypto function. So switching the, to the async version actually helps clear that bottleneck up. If running with CLI flags isn't really your thing, um, and you like to use APIs instead, there's the inspector module inside Node. It is similar to the CLI flags, but you can start and stop the profiler from code. This is an example of how you might do a CPO profile. We require the inspector module, create a new session and connect to it, then enable and start the profile profiler. Do some tasks, then stop the profiler. And the file that is output can actually be loaded into the profile section of Chrome DevTools to get a more visual view of what's going on. Next up is trace events. The trace events module provides a mechanism to centralize tracing information generated by V8, node core, and user code. Tracing can be enabled with, a, with the flag trace event categories or by using the trace events module. The trace event category flag accepts a list of common, a comma separated category names, which allows users to create custom traces. By default, the node, node async hooks, and the V8 categories are all enabled. And like the inspector module, running Node.js with and tracing enabled will produce log files that can be opened up into the tracing tab of, uh, of Chrome DevTools. So in this example, we're creating a trace for the promise rejections category which enables capture of trace data, tracking the number of unhandled promise rejections and handle after rejections. There's actually a, a lot more categories. So after this talk, I would invite you to take a look at the trace events API docs and Node.js.org to learn some to learn more. Next, we have the perf hooks module. These APIs allow developers to set various markers that make measuring the runtime of an application easier. This module provides an implementation of a subset of the web performance APIs as well as additional APIs for Node specific performance measurements. Node supports the following web performance APIs, high resolution time, performance timeline, and user timing. With these APIs, you can measure the time it takes individual dependencies to load and how long your app takes to initially start, as well as determining how well the event loop is being used, utilized and if your asynchronous code is operating efficiently. Here's a quick example how you might measure the duration of require operations to load dependencies. It uses the Tumrify function, which is part of the performance API. So the slide after this one assumes some knowledge of the Node.js event loop. So while we won't go too deep into all that right now, I just wanted to show the high level diagram of what it might look like. From a fresh start, new calls come in to the poll phase and traverse through the event loop. If we had code that was synchronous, it might block other code from being executed. So an important addition to the perf hooks module in 
is event loop utilization, or U ELU as we might um, call it from, from this point, which was added in the middle of the node 12 and 14 life cycles, as well as being part of node 16. The event loop utilization method returns an object that contains the cumulative duration of time the event loop has been both idle and active. E e ELU is similar to CPU utilization, except that it only measures event loop statistics and not CPU usage. It represents the percentage of time the event loop has spent outside the event loops provider. No other CPU idle time is taken into consideration. The following is an example of how a mostly idle CPU process will have a high ELU. So in this example, we are synchronously spawning a sleep timeout, which blocks the event loop. So even though the CPU would be mostly idle, our event loop is blocked, which would slow down our application. So this is a great new addition to be able to determine where a problem might be. And of course, once you're ready to pull your application to a container-based platform, it becomes a little more difficult to get mm -hmm. access to those types of things. In this next section, we will talk about getting environment, getting access to some of the data that I just mentioned when running inside a Kubernetes environment. So one of the most production-ready solutions for monitoring containerized applications is the open source Prometheus Toolkit. Prometheus is a mature and battle-tested monitoring and alerting tool that provides multiple features, such as dimensional data that can be identified by metric name and key value pairs, a very powerful and flexible query language so you can merge different metrics together to produce more complex and meaningful ones, multiple modes of graphing and dashboarding, although for these, you'll have to use a third-party tool like Grafana, for example. And the nice thing about Prometheus is that you can find integration libraries for all sorts of languages and frameworks, which is really nice. Oh, and there is one more important detail, Prometheus's Prometheus' pull model. This means that you have to provide the collected metrics somehow, like through an API endpoint or something, so the Prometheus can scrape and collect the desired metrics afterwards. And we'll see a way to automate this, actually, in the coming slides. Okay, so how do we expose some metrics to Prometheus from Node.js? We use a library called Prom Client that offers a great deal of features. First of all, Prime Client can provide, by default, many of the metrics that I mentioned before, like garbage collection metrics, event loop lag metrics, etc. We can, of course, create our own metrics that we want to, want to measure. And one nice thing about Prime Client is that it allows us to use a push gateway model if necessary. That means that we can directly send data to Prometheus without waiting for Prometheus to scrape them. Now, you may be wondering why this is useful. Well, think of the situation where we measure metrics from a batch or our background job. Unfortunately, the job does not leave enough for Prometheus to scrape the data, but for some reason, we really need to get those metrics to Prometheus. Now, this is where the push gateway comes in handy because the batch background job can push the metrics directly to Prometheus right before it finishes. So eventually, Prometheus will get the metrics that we want. In general, though, we use the push gateway method only on edge case scenarios. So here's a small code snippet of how you require the prompt client module inside your application. This code is basically saying, hey, let me collect all the default metrics that you got. We're also adding a prefix to our metrics, which will help later when we want to see metrics for just our application. And if there was more than one application, it also would help determining which application metrics that you're looking at. And a few lines of code later, we expose those metrics in the metrics endpoint. This is a code snippet from the demo that we're going to show in a couple minutes. And if we visit that metrics endpoint that we just saw from that we just saw from the browser, this is what we'll get. And of course, there's more information that is collected, but I'm only showing a small subset since the slides aren't that big. Um, we can also see that each of the metrics that have been provided have our prefix that we added from the code snippet on the previous slide. If we have more than one application, you can see how this prefix could be quite useful. So I mentioned above that the prompt client we create we can create custom metrics if we want to for our application, but what kind of metrics are really useful? Uh, enter red metrics. The red metrics def method defines the three key metrics. Well, there's basically four, but the following three are the important ones. You should measure for every microservice in your architecture. Uh, these metrics are part of the four golden signal series defined by Google Site Re Reliability Engineering. So basically, a couple years back, Google published a book based on their experiences about what metrics help them maintain their huge infrastructure. And these metrics are rate, 
number of requests per second your services are serving, the number of fail requests per second, which are errors, and the distribute, distribute, yeah, it's a very tough word to say, um, the distribution of the amount of time of each request takes, which would be the duration. So just by monitoring all th these three key metrics, you can deduce a lot of what your application performs in general. All right, so let's take a quick look at the demo. It's uh, we, we did I did a recording so just in case anything went wrong with the demo gods here. So we'll make that full screen, and we'll pause it just real quick, uh, just to kind of explain what's going on a little bit. So the application is just a basic REST application. Um, Express.js application with two endpoints. The first is the API greeting endpoint, which will either return a small message or a failure. The failure comes from a function that produces random failures for the purpose, just for the purpose of the demo. And the other endpoint is the metric endpoint that we saw earlier, and that, you know, that Prometheus needs that. Uh, here, I'm, I'm actually using OpenShift, which is a flavor of Kubernetes because it comes with Prometheus already built in. So I won't have to manually deploy and set all the Prometheus operator. And the whole goal of this demo is to measure the average request duration and graph it over the last five minutes. So I'll we'll pause the video and let that play. Um, here we're using, to deploy the application, we're using uh, a, a CLI tool called NodeShift. And what this is, does, is it basically it'll take your code that you've written, um, not needing to, to know what, what, a, what a Docker file or anything like that is, and it'll package it up, push it up to OpenShift, and then on OpenShift itself, it will run the source to image, um, it'll run a source to image build, um, which also known as an S2I build, which containerizes your application. And then once the application is containerized, it pushes it into uh, OpenShift's internal container registry and uses that to deploy uh, the application. It also allows you to not have to write any YAML files and has some very sensible defaults. So you, really all you have to do is worry about your code and, uh, and, and, and NoShift will take care of the rest. So now that application is deployed and it's almost deployed, it's still green. Okay, there we go, it's running. Now that it's deployed, we can get the URL and make sure that the correct, and go to the correct endpoint, which is that API greeting. And this should show, and once we go there, it should show us some hello world message. And let's see if we refresh a couple times, we'll see that we also get those error messages that we mentioned. There was, there we go, random failure one, random failure two. And there's also the, the metrics endpoint that will provide the metrics of our application. So we can scroll past all the default ones to the bottom where we have our custom metrics that we want to provide to Prometheus, which is all those HTTP related um, metrics that we've collected. So clicking on the monitoring section, we can get some basic information, things like memory usage. Uh, we can reduce the time frame. Yep, there we go, memory usage. We can reduce the time frame to zoom out a little bit. Here, I'll pause real quick here. Um, to clarify that these, that while these metrics, these are metrics, there is one important detail that all the metrics here we're seeing are coming from OpenShift itself since we haven't yet activated Prometheus. And to get Prometheus to start scraping our metrics, we'll need to deploy a service monitor YAML. So we'll do that right in about a second once we go over there. Do that. So here I'll have to deploy a service monitor. The service monitor is really just a 10 line YAML that we specify the metrics endpoint that Prometheus will scrape. The scrape there's a scrape interval in there and some other, other things. And after this demo, we'll take a look at what actually that, um, that service monitor will, will look like. Might just take a couple seconds based on um, the OpenShift that we're using. There we go. So let's put the service monitor. Yep, let's take a couple seconds. Now that the service monitor is deployed, we're going to do. We're going to use Apache Bench to stress test our endpoint a little bit. So we're going to do five thousand requests um, at hundred requests every time. 
and we have to make sure we do to the API greeting. This should really shouldn't take too long. It's a pretty it's a pretty quick uh, operation. All right, once that's done, we can go back to our metrics view and add a custom, a custom query. And while this custom query does look a little weird, it's just a mean average calculation with the metrics that we've collected. And we can zoom into a five minute portion of the graph to see that there are two lines. There we go. There's two lines there. One's success, one's five, a 500 error. And that is um, because of the Either we're getting back hello world or we're getting back an error message. So we can pause our, that's the end of the demo. We can pause it there, we continue on. There we go. So like I said, we had to, in order to have Prometheus activated and getting all of our uh, metrics from our application, we had to create this thing called service monitor. And as we, as we can see, we have our endpoint that says, hey, every 30 seconds, we're going to do a scrape, and we're going to match this particular project with this My App label, which we added a lot earlier. So while this isn't necessarily um, an observability tool that's built into Node at all, uh, I did quickly want to mention the effort that Red Hat and IBM have, been, have started to define what types of thing developers could be adding to their applications to be the best that they can be. Uh, for example, we we're in the process of putting together um, an observability and metric section. Uh, what this is is a reference architecture, and it's not to be um, a end-all, be-all of this is how you should do things. It's the opinions that are here are coming from our experiences from Red Hat and IBM, from our customer interactions. And the repo is open for all those who would like to contribute. contribute. Uh, if you go to nodeshift.dev, there should be links to go to uh, the reference architecture. And there's a, there's a bunch of other sections that we're starting to work on, which would be great to have some other feedback. All right, just to, so to, to uh, wrap up, there's some, so some articles you can check out, like Prometheus, the, the prompt client, the reference architecture, going to node shift dev. There's a great blog post uh, written by uh, one of our colleagues about monitoring node applications on OpenShift. So I would definitely go give that a Google and, and to check that out. And thank you very much. And